Well now, ladies and gentlemen, we're in for the second half now. And we're now going to... We've had Nicholas Nickleby. Next, you're going to meet Martin Chuzzlewit. Now, uh, what do you know about Martin Chuzzlewit? Well, he is the gentleman who is... Uh, uh, we're going, you're going to meet Mr. Pecksniff, and you're going to meet young Mary. And uh, this, is the, this is the father, Mr. Pecksniff. There he is. Give him a clap. Ah, but you don't want to clap at the end when you see what he gets up to. Ah, that's the whole point. I'm in the right now. Yes, because I wrote the book. I'm getting the claps in first. Yeah. <laughs> you sit down for a minute. <laughs> this father, Mr. Pecksniff, is already married, having two daughters of his own. Here he is proposing to young Mary and plans to break up her relationship with young Martin Chuzzlewit, Chuzzlewit, thereby working his pleasant way into the fortunes of old Chuzzlewit. What a sly old fox who can give him a hiss, actually. Mr. Pecksniff, the architect, went forth upon his morning walk. The summer weather in his bosom was reflected in the breast of nature. Through deep green vistas where the boughs arched overhead, the placid Pecksniff strolled. By meadow gates and hedges fragrant with wild roses, and by thatched roof cottages whose inmates humbly bowed before him as a man both good and the worthy Pecksniff walked in tranquil meditation. Ah, chancing to trip in his abstraction over the spreading root of an old tree, he raised his pious eyes to take a survey of the ground before him. It startled him to see the embodied image of his thoughts. Not Mr. Pecksniff kissed his hand and was at her side immediately. Communing with nature, so am I. She said the morning was so beautiful that she walked further than she intended and would return. Mr. Pecksniff said it was exactly his case and he would return with her. You would take my arm to go. You were loitering when I came upon you. Why be so cruel as to hurry now? You would not shun me, would you? Yes, I would. <laughs> no, no, I would not. Release me, Mr. Pecksniff. Your touch is disagreeable to me. His touch? What? That chaste patriarchal touch, which Mrs. Todgers, surely a discreet lady, had endured well, not only without complaint, but without satisfaction. This was positively wrong. Mr. Pecksniff was sorry to hear her say it. If you have not observed that it is so, pray take assurance from my lips and do not, as you are a gentleman, continue to offend me. Oh, well, well, I, I feel that I might consider this becoming in a daughter of my own, and, and why should I object to it in one so beautiful? It's harsh, it cuts me to the soul. But I cannot quarrel with you, Mary. She tried to say she was sorry to hear it. Then with his disengaged hand catching hers, he employed himself in separating the fingers with his own, and sometimes kissing them. I am glad we met. I'm now at ease to ease my bosom of a heavy load and speak to you in confidence, Mary. A fantastic thing, that maiden affectation. <laughs> she made to believe. Shudder. I love you, my gentle life, with a devotion which is quite surprising even to myself. <laughs> I did suppose that the sensation was buried in the silent tomb of a lady, only second to you in qualities of mind and form, but I find I'm mistaken. She tried to disengage her hand 
but might as well have tried to free herself from the embrace of an affectionate boa constrictor. <laughs> <laughs> Although I am a widower, a, a widower with two daughters, still I am not encumbered by love. One of them, as you know, is married, the other by her own desire, but with a view, I will confess, why not, to my altering my condition, is about to leave her father's house. I have character, I hope, please, people are pleased to speak well of me. I, I think my person and manner are not absolutely those of a monster, I trust. <laughs> ah, naughty hand, why did you take me prisoner? Go, go. <laughs> he slapped the hand to punish it, but relented a thought of it in his waistcoat to comfort it again. Blessed in each other and in the society of our venerable old friend Chuzzlewit, my darling, we shall be happy. When he is wafted to ha haven of rest, we will console each other. My pretty primrose, <laughs> what do you say? It is possible that I ought to feel grateful for this mm -hmm. mark of your confidence. I cannot say that I do, but I am willing to suppose you may deserve my thanks. Take them and pray leave me, Mr. Pecksniff. <laughs> Mr. Pecksniff put his arm around her, her hand in his. If you force me, she said. If you force me, by your superior strength, to accompany you back and to be the subject of your insolence upon the way, you cannot constrain the expression of my thoughts. I hold you in the deepest abhorrence. I know your real nature and despise it. No, no. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> By what arts or unhappy chances you have gained your influence over Mrs. Chuzzlewit, I do not know. It may be strong enough to soften this, but he shall know of this. Trust me, sir. Mr. Pecksniff raised his heavy eyelids languidly <laughs> and let them fall again. It was saying with perfect coolness, oh, indeed. Not enough that you warp and change his nature, adapt his every prejudice to your bad end, and harden a heart naturally kind by shutting out the truth and allowing none but false and distorted views to reach it. Is it not enough that you have the power of doing this and that you exercise it, but you also be so coarse, so cruel, and so cowardly to me? Still, Mr. Pecksniff held on and looked as mild as any lamb. Will nothing, nothing move you, sir? My dear, a habit of self-examination <laughs> and the practice of, shall I say, virtue? <laughs> of hypocrisy? Oh, no, no. <laughs> of virtue have enabled me to set such guards upon myself that it is really difficult to ruffle me. It is a curious fact, but it is difficult, do you know, for anyone to ruffle me. And did she think that she could? Oh, how little did she know his heart. Little indeed. <laughs> she would have preferred the caresses of a toad, an adder or a serpent. Nay, the hug of a bear to the endearments of Mr. Come, come, a word or two will set this matter right and establish a pleasant understanding between us. I am not angry, my love. You? Angry? No! <laughs> I am not, I say so. Neither are you. There was a beating heart beneath his hand that told another story, though. I am sure you are not, and I will tell you why. There are two <coughs> Martin Chuzzlewits, my dear and you're carrying your anger to one, might have a serious effect, who knows, on the other. You wouldn't wish to hurt him, would you? She trembled violently and looked at him with such a proud disdain that he turned his eyes away, no doubt lest he should be offended with her, in spite of his better self. A passive quarrel, my love, may be changed into an active one, remember. It would be sad to blight even a disinherited young man in his already blighted prospects. But how easy to do it. Ah, 
How easy. Have I influence with our vulnerable friend, do you think? Well, perhaps I have. Perhaps I have. He raised his eyes to hers and nodded with an air of banter that was charming. No, upon the whole, my sweet, if, if I were you, I'd keep my secret to myself. I am not at all sure, but very far from it, that it would surprise our friend in any way, for he and I have had some conversation together only this morning, and he is anxious, very anxious, to establish you in some more settled manner. But whether he is surprised or not surprised, the consequence of your imparting it might be the same. Martin Jr. might suffer Severely, I'd have no compassion on Martin Jr. Or I would have compassion on Martin Jr., do you know? Yes, he don't deserve it, but I would. She wept so bitterly now, and was so much distressed, that he thought it prudent to unclasp her and hold her only by the hand. As to our own share is this precious little mystery, we will keep it to ourselves and talk of it between ourselves, and you shall think it over. You will consent, my dear. You will consent, I know. Whatever you may think, you will. I seem to remember to have heard, I really don't know where or how, that you and Martin Jr., when you were children, had a sort of childish fondness for each other. When we are married, you shall have the satisfaction of thinking <coughs> that it didn't last to ruin him, but passed away to do him good. For we'll see then what we can do to put some trifling help in Martin Jr.'s way. <laughs> have I any influence with our venerable friend? Well, perhaps I have. Perhaps I have. The outlet from the wood in which these tender it was close to Mr. Pecksniff's house. They were now so near it that he stopped and holding up her little finger as he rose, said in playful accidents a party fancy. Shall I bite it? <laughs> <laughs> Receiving no reply, he kissed it instead and then stooping down inclined his flabby face to hers. <laughs> he had a flabby face, although he was a good man. And with a blessing which from such a source was quite enough to set her up for life and prosper her from that time forth, permitted her to leave him. <laughs> That's Martin Tuttlebit. <laughs>